Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jane and Jason Bautista? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Jane Marie Bautista was born on December 18, 1961, in the state of Illinois. She had one older sister. Her family was well off financially. In 1979, Jane graduated from high school. She attended college in Wisconsin on and off for the next nine years, but never graduated. One night in 1980, after Jane's mother refused to let her use the family car, Jane beat her mother brutally. The police were never called, but the attack created a lot of tension in the relationship. In 1981, Jane met a local handyman named Armando Bautista. He was from Belize. People who knew Jane were surprised that she was interested in someone who did not have any money and had low earning potential. The couple married that same year, but the relationship was rocky from the beginning. As Armando struggled to find work, Jane worked part-time in a clerical position. On August 25, 1982, Jane had a son named Jason Victor Bautista. When he was a year old, she separated from Armando and moved into her own apartment. Armando was desperate to have her back, declaring that he could not live without her. On April 7, 1984, Armando demonstrated how serious he was about this declaration by using a 357 Magnum revolver to create a fatal self-inflicted gunshot wound while sitting in his car. He left a note behind telling Jane that she was all he ever wanted. As far as his son Jason, Armando wrote, someday he'll understand. After Armando's death, Jane's mental health deteriorated rapidly. She became increasingly erratic and would never let anyone say Armando's name. It didn't take long for Jane to find a new lover. His name was Jose. On July 4, 1987, Jane had a son named Matthew Benjamin Montejo. Near the end of 1988, the family moved to San Diego, California, where Jose left Jane. In 1992, Jane moved with her sons to San Marcos, California. She developed paranoia as well as other mental health symptoms. Jane started badly mistreating Jason and Matthew and would continue this behavior for the rest of her life. Her sons really didn't know what was happening. Jason did not suspect his mother was mentally ill until 1995. The family left San Marcos due to Jane's paranoia. They moved around a lot, sometimes living in motels. In 1998, they ended up living in a house in Menifee, California. Here they almost had a normal existence. Jane even started dating. She was still paranoid, but not quite as much as usual. In high school, Jason performed well academically and even graduated a year early. He went to a local college where he studied chemistry. To earn a few extra dollars, he worked part-time at the lab and part-time at a hotel. In the summer of 2000, Jane's mental health symptoms became markedly worse. The family moved to Wildemar, California. After Jane's paranoia intensified again, the family left Wildemar and lived in a series of motels. In June 2002, they moved into an apartment in Riverside, California, which was a significant departure from their nomadic existence. It appeared as though a time of relative peace was upon the family, but that peace would not last. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. All the stress of living with a mentally ill mother took a toll on Jason. He told Matthew that he had thought about murdering Jane. He had discovered some ideas about murder by watching episodes of the TV series, The Sopranos. The way the character Tony Soprano handled his mother, as well as other people who annoyed him, was an inspiration for Jason. In one episode, Tony killed a man in a self-defense-like situation. Jason wanted to do the same thing to his mother. His plan was to provoke her into attacking him so he could defend himself with lethal force. On January 14, 2003, 20-year-old Jason spent time on the college campus before returning home. That night, he and his 41-year-old mother 
became engaged in a terrible argument as 15-year-old Matthew went into another room. During the argument, Jason strangled and beat his mother. When Matthew came out of the room and saw his mother dead, Jason explained how they would have to take care of it, just like the Sopranos. Jason cut off his mother's head and hands and put them in a black duffel bag. He placed her body into a sleeping bag before loading her body into the trunk of her 2000 Oldsmobile Intrigue. Jane never let Jason drive this vehicle, and now it was being used to transport her body. Jason and Matthew drove to a housing complex that was being built in Oceanside, California. This is about 80 miles away. They arrived at about 2 a.m., now on January 15, and tried to place Jane's body in a dumpster that was in front of a house on South Pacific Street. A security guard spotted them and told them they could not dump anything there. Jason and Matthew started to move Jane's body back to the trunk when the security guard saw a foot stick out from the sleeping bag. He said, stop, put the bag down. Jason responded, no. The security guard pointed his 357 Magnum revolver at the teenagers and said, freeze. Jason looked up at him and said, blank you, you're just a security guard. You can't do anything. He slammed the lid of the trunk and drove away. But the security guard managed to get the license plate on the Oldsmobile Intrigue. After driving to San Juan Capistrano, Jason threw his mother's body off a cliff on Ortega Highway. Her body was found in the morning. It didn't take long for the police to connect this discovery with the report made by the security guard. Officers caught up with Jason on January 24, 2003, and he unwisely agreed to be interviewed. He told the police that his mother met men online all the time, and he thought that she was with one of these men in Corona. She had not been around for weeks. When confronted with the evidence, Jason confessed to killing his mother, but said he acted in self-defense. Both Jason and Matthew were arrested in connection with Jane's death. Matthew and his attorneys approached the state and told them about how Jason had planned the murder long in advance. This was not a self-defense situation. Matthew was offered a plea bargain, and Jason went on trial for first-degree murder. At his trial, Jason stayed with his story that the killing was in self-defense. Jane had retrieved her favorite knife from the kitchen and attacked him. He was just trying to protect himself when he strangled her. On February 4, 2005, Jason was convicted of first-degree murder. Two months later, he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. His brother Matthew pleaded guilty to being an accessory to murder. He was sentenced to the 749 days he had already spent in jail. So he was released immediately. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. When Jane was young, she was described as pretentious, combative, arrogant, condescending, quick to anger, and strong-willed. She thought that she was better than other people. Jane was also described as outgoing and intelligent. Her mental health symptoms ended up dominating her life. Jane was paranoid and psychotic. She reported being spied on and believed people were trying to kill her. In one residence, she covered the windows with tinfoil. Jane was not a big fan of being photographed. Her driver's license photo may have been the only time she let someone take her picture. In addition to cameras, Jane did not like cell phones. She thought that her enemies could use them to track her. One recurring delusion that Jane had involved her belief that musicians were stealing song lyrics that she wrote. Music industry executives were watching her and trying to kill her. She wanted to communicate directly with the musicians to convince them to refrain from the homicidal activity. Over time, Jane added many different people to the list of those who were out to get her. For example, she thought that people from Mexico were hiding in her bushes and living in her backyard. Jane never received mental health counseling at any time during her life. There's no way to know exactly what was going on, but it is reasonable to believe that she was suffering from a disorder like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or bipolar disorder. Item number two. Unfortunately, Jane's mental health symptoms may have contributed to the terrible mistreatment of Jason and Matthew. Whatever the cause, they suffered tremendously at her hands. For example, 
Jane would beat them with wooden spoons, belts, sticks, and clubs. She threatened them with a knife. On one occasion, she tied Jason with a 100-foot extension cord and held him hostage for four hours because he earned a B in algebra. One attack against Jason resulted in him visiting the emergency room. Even the smallest infraction would lead to a dramatic and potentially violent reaction by Jane. She would frequently scream at her sons. Neighbors said they could hear loud arguments, profanity, moaning, and howling as if from a wild animal. It wasn't always clear who Jane was yelling at. It was definitely her sons some of the time, but on other occasions it may have been someone who was not there, like Jane was hallucinating. One message Jane's sons received repeatedly was how they were just like their good-for-nothing fathers. As if all this wasn't stressful enough, the family moved around a lot, and Jane had many different romantic partners. Neighbors thought that she may have been a sex worker because she left her residence after midnight and went to local hotels with men. One neighbor followed her and saw a man handing her an envelope outside a hotel. Item number three. Jason was described as intelligent, isolated, socially awkward, unpopular, quiet, insecure, anxious, and arrogant. One belief he maintained was that he was smarter than everyone else, even his teachers. Jason's co-workers said that he was respectful to people above him in the chain of command, but impolite to people at the same level. He was particularly condescending toward women. There wasn't much hope that Jason would be successful romantically due to his social awkwardness, but he did get one classmate to agree to go on a date with him. Unfortunately, his mother made him cancel his plans, declaring that he was not man enough to have a date. Item number four. The theory that Jason was inspired by the TV show The Sopranos is well supported by the evidence. He watched several episodes of the show before the murder and made a reference to it after the murder. The idea to remove his mother's head and hands came from an episode where the protagonist, Tony Soprano, did the same thing to a victim. It's easy to see why Jason connected to Tony's experiences, especially considering what happened in season one of the show. Tony had all kinds of problems with his narcissistic mother, and she even tried to have him killed. Jason's over-reliance on strategies found on a TV show point to his immaturity, isolation, and desperation. Item number five, Jason maintains his innocence, and he has a few supporters, even a few of the jurors were sympathetic to Jason's situation. After voting to convict, one jury member even changed her mind and said the evidence pointed toward manslaughter, not murder. The judge said it was too late for her to change her mind. The state, of course, stands by the first-degree murder conviction and painted Jason as a monster. This brings me to the question, was Jason guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty starting with the inculpatory factors. In addition to being strangled, Jane was severely beaten. The area above her eyes had been crushed so badly, the bones disintegrated when the medical examiner touched them. This was not a situation that involved only strangulation. Four months before the killing, Jason told his co-workers that his mother was planning on moving to Chicago. She would be there for an indefinite period. It is clear that Jason planned for his mother to be gone far in advance. Jason was six foot two and weighed 210 pounds. His mother Jane was five foot seven and weighed 145 pounds. Jason claimed that his mother attacked him with a knife, but he did not sustain any cuts. It is true that Jane horribly mistreated Jason, but he was an adult at the time of the killing. He did not have to live with his mother. Jason had many other options. Jason's actions after the murder are consistent with being callous and cold. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Jane was a terrible mother who mistreated Jason for his entire life. Her behavior was completely unacceptable, and if she had been caught in the act, she certainly would have been arrested and convicted. Due to the mistreatment, Jason was isolated and had poor problem-solving skills. Maybe this contributed to him entertaining murder as a solution instead of finding other options. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Jason was guilty? Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. One of the jury members suggested that the jury was looking for a way to believe him,
but there was nothing they could do based on his behavior. That sums up the problem pretty well. Jason was a sympathetic figure, but his actions were technically consistent with first-degree murder. I think what happened here is that after years of dealing with mistreatment at the hands of his mother, Jason simply had enough. He wanted to live his life, but his mother was getting in the way. Jane inadvertently created the instrument of her own demise, forging a killer in a furnace of paranoia, delusions, erratic behavior, anger, and aggression. Jason may not have been a made man, the way the term is used in The Sopranos, but Jane made him the man that he was. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jane and Jason Bautista. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.